are not imagining it. Teams play better when they are losing. Your team winning in the fourth quarter, they will suck. They'll only score in about 29% of all possessions. And the other team losing, Super Saiyans. In the final two minutes, they'll score on 49% of all possessions. There is a rubber band effect that occurs in pretty much every sport, and football here is no exception. Using expected points added, on the left we see trailing teams performing much better than average, and on the right we see winning teams playing like losers. This is weird, because if there's one thing America hates, it's not losing, it's playing to lose. Cam Newton decides not to dive. Pussyfooting around, just hoping the other team makes a mistake. I mean, we've all seen this, but roll the tape anyways. You ain't first, you're last. We have the opportunity to play like God. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. You play to win the game. Nothing embodies this more than the spineless action of prevent defense. The Patriots down 21-3. We've all seen it. The winning team takes their foot off the gas. No fear, try to lose! This cowardly coverage allows the offense to dink and dunk their way all the way down the field. Let's start showing some fight! Stealing a victory. What a comeback! Prevent? <laughs> the only thing this does is prevent you from winning the game. So why then? Does the defense insist on playing this way? And better yet, what took the offense so long? Why didn't they play like this the whole game? Brady with no pressure. Whether psychological or formational, losing. Touchdown, no flags. Leads to winning. Let's make sure that we're super clear on this. Trailing teams, they score a lot more in late game situations. In a normal football scenario, we'll say first or second quarter where it is tied, the field goal rate for an offense is 17%. The touchdown rate for an offense is 23%, bringing our scoring rate up to about 40% for a normal possession. Meanwhile, in needed scenarios, the offense is scoring a lot more. When down by one to three points in the two minute drill, an offense can expect a field goal 26% of the time and a touchdown 23% of the time. When an offense is down by four to seven points and they need a touchdown, they are getting one a whopping 37% of the time. This makes for a strange spectating experience. You're not comfortable when you're winning and you're sure as hell not comfortable when you're losing. And yet somehow, this sick-minded individual huh. still trots out his soft-minded approach. That's right. The game of the year! Take a look at this Bills play right here. Down by a field goal after a catastrophic fumble on their one yard line, Allen sets up the hurry up offense with just 36 seconds remaining. Minnesota is more than comfortable with Knox catching this ball and he quickly gets out of bounds. Minnesota is lined up deep. Their safeties are about 20 yards off the ball and they have five other defensive backs roughly 10 yards off the ball. They seem more than comfortable giving the Bills anything underneath, and that's exactly what happens. Knox gets about 12 yards and quickly gets out of bounds. On our second play here, the safeties are even deeper, roughly 25 yards off the ball, and five other defensive backs about 10 yards off the ball. Pretty much the same result. Knox eight yards out of bounds. On our third play here, the defense has clearly made an adjustment. Now we only have one safety fairly deep, but it's clear that this is still a soft approach. Knox is wide open again here in the flat if he wants it, but he's got one-on-one -on -one coverage with Davis, and sure enough, we get another chunk play. And out of bounds. Now the Bills are pretty much in field goal range, and we're going to see a hilarious play. The Vikings are playing so soft that McKenzie catches this ball, makes the mistake of going inside, and still has plenty of time to get outside, get the first down, and get out of bounds. The result? Quick 12-yard gain out of bounds to stop the clock, followed by another 8-yard gain out of bounds to stop the clock, followed by another 20-yard gain out of bounds to stop the clock, followed by another 15-yard gain in bounds. No, there's so much cushion here, he still gets out of bounds. In 19 seconds, the Bills hit four plays to get in field goal range and send the game into overtime. And he hooks it through! How can any sane individual think this is okay? Haven't they seen this movie before? Yeah. No, 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 no. Widely speaking, in the first three quarters, there isn't much difference in EPA per play. Then all of a sudden, yeah. If you're leading, you become a loser. If you're losing, 
Super Saiyan. Is this just situational football? How much of this rubber band effect is prevent defense? To answer that, let's get clear on what prevent defense is. Prevent defense is a little ambiguous. Some refer to it in the Herm way, psychologically. Hello? Others, the more traditional way, formations. Let's maybe start with the basic tenets of prevent defense. Eliminate big plays and burn clock. As far as the formation, here's my way of looking at it. A gradient. On the left, we have drop 11 as the most extreme version of prevent. And no, this is not in theory. The Rams actually did this against the Seahawks. The Rams dropped all 11 individuals on this play. Yes, all 11 against the Seahawks. They attempted not only to prevent a deep pass, but a short one as well. And it still didn't work. Shahid's got it with one second. This seems to be about as preventative as possible. The far more common version of prevent is drop eight. And this is something you've probably seen before. Eight defensive players drop back in coverage and only three players rush the quarterback. This gives the quarterback more time to make his decision, but more hazards to be aware of when throwing. Some people, like Sam Schwartzstein, think this drop eight coverage could be on the rise, a quasi-prevent defense that's not designed to stop the deep ball, but instead disrupt timing. Drop eight is famously the coverage the Bengals used against Mahomes in the 2022 AFC Championship. Rewatching the film, it looks like they ran this roughly one out of every three plays, and Mahomes struggled to find his quick game in the second half, where he only threw for 55 yards. Another example in an earlier Seahawks-Rams game, the Hawks surprised Stafford. You can see him hesitate here as he's recognizing there are eight players in coverage. Timing is everything on these quick plays they can be more difficult to improvise on. So again, drop eight is not just a prevent defense. However, it absolutely can be, especially if we have depth with the defensive backs. This is at least something we can work with. Now, how well do offenses throw against the most common version of prevent? Drop eight. First play of the game is a Chargers interception. We would expect that more defenders means a worse passing attack. And is that picked off? Yeah, there's maybe less pressure, but if everyone knows that you're about to throw, then... Oh, quarterbacks are slightly better against drop eight. That seems counterintuitive because there's more guys in coverage, but completion percentage is also relatively stable against drop eight. Interceptions as well. Okay, so drop eight doesn't really seem to be doing much preventing. Um, let's look a little further though. How about limiting explosive plays? Against drop eight, quarterbacks are completing 36.8% of their deep passes. All other coverage types, 35.5. With the help of a friend, I also had a chance to look at safety depth. Here's what it looks like as time goes on. While the starting position difference is only a few yards and that might not seem like a lot, the message is pretty clear. Take extra precaution so you absolutely do not get beat deep. Again, quarterbacks are more effective against drop eight. Herbert has all day in the pocket, takes a shot downfield, caught, Quentin Johnson, touchdown! So as we're seeing in a lot of these scenarios, defenses are getting carved up in late game scenarios, at least on average. So why are defensive coordinators so soft? I know what's not soft. The sponsor of this video. Electric bikes. I was genuinely excited to do an ad for this company because I can't ride my dirt bike here um, for obvious reasons. So Electric was a big brand that I had heard of and when they reached out, I was stoked. This thing is so fun to ride. I mean, I have just taken it late at night to cruise around, blow off some steam. I have taken it downtown to Mariners games. You can do a lot. They have several different modes. You can get a little help with pedal assist. You can put it in turbo or you can ride it just like a bike. It's also super easy to store. You can fold it up and throw it in the back of your sick-ass compact SUV. Charge it up in just a few hours, and you're back on the road. Electric has several different options and colors to personalize it in any way that you'd like. I went with the green. Hills are chill. They got a bunch of different sales going on, so click the link in the description. Check out Electric Bikes today. Let's look at what coaches have to say on this. Bates banks it in. Let's say you're up by two scores. Do they have the time to put two 10 play drive together? That, that tends to be the benchmark. If they don't, you sit a pre and you let them have the yards and you maybe even let them score because the odds are in your favor. 
The only reason you rush three guys is you're defending the sidelines. You're keeping them in bounds. You're using extra defenders to keep the ball in play so the clock winds out. The math is fairly straightforward. The average fourth quarter drive takes about three and a half minutes. So if you're sitting at, say, a three possession lead, let them have five to 10 yards of play, tackle them in bounds, and you will win. And what a job by this Lions defense. That math? It's not mathing here. And the Bills game is far from our only example, but I don't think I need to show you that. This is memorable because it's painful. At least when your team's the one losing. As John Madden used to say, the only time fans don't like prevent Brady lays it out perfectly. is when it doesn't work. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. Let's work through this together. What makes the fourth quarter so different? Clarity. Despite the game's outcome still being uncertain, there is more clarity for play callers. If they're trailing in the final minutes, they know they need to score. This means more fourth down attempts. This means more passing. This means more deep passing attempts. That means more man, aggression. If we hate playing to lose, man, do we love aggression. But is it really aggressive if it's fourth and 10 for the Rams here and they're trailing in the final minutes? Not at all. In fact, they know they need to go for it. They know they need to pass in order to help preserve the clock and try to get as much yards as possible. And the defense knows this, which is why we see an increase in these prevent style defenses, an increase in at least softer defenses late in the game when a team is leading. Which is why quarterbacks see a better EPA. Huh. Trailing quarterbacks in the fourth quarter? Their EPA plummets. This doesn't really match the eye test. I mean, we watched Allen easily pick apart that team and teams score more. Wouldn't that mean quarterbacks and offenses are playing more effectively? Kind of. You see, two things can be true at the same time. A team can score on a larger percentage of their possessions, and that same team might still be playing losing football. That seems counterintuitive, but consider the following example. It's 4th and 10, and the Buccaneers trail the Texans by 5 points with a minute 24 remaining. There's no secret here, uh, they're going for it. Baker shakes off the pressure, and a 15-yard scramble keeps the drive alive. The Bucks string together a few more plays, and White runs in for a two-yard touchdown with just a few seconds remaining. That'd be an L for the Texans, and an L for soft coverage. But what can we learn from this? In normal football, going for it on fourth and 10 on your own 32-yard line is batshit crazy. The risk of a turnover on downs is substantially more than the benefit of a single first down, which is why you should punt the ball. This is not normal football though, which is why EPA per play plummets in the fourth quarter. Offenses would be terrible if they always played this way. Yes, they might score on a higher percentage of their possessions, but the other times wouldn't be that good. They'd be giving up the ball a lot in enemy territory. Additionally, turnover rate skyrockets for an offense. Now that doesn't mean that the offense is off the hook here. On average, there are many plays earlier in the game where an offense probably should have been a little bit more aggressive. We've already seen an increase in teams going for it on fourth down, but we still see teams running the ball far too frequently on first down. Remember our Nash equilibrium here from previous videos. If the defense does not adjust, the offense should choose the more lucrative option every single time until the defense adjusts. The more lucrative option here being passing. These numbers are skewed in a way that suggests offenses should pass more until the defense forces them to run. The Rams finally took this approach against the Seahawks. Instead of matching their heavy package, they rolled out a defense more geared to stop a passing attack. And Darnold fell apart. It's intercepted at the 35. It's intercepted again. Intercepted. Intercepted for the fourth time. All of this helps us answer the offensive side of the ball, but we're still left wondering, what about the defense? The Bears lose. 
losing streak comes to an end. A friend of mine recently pointed out something that I think a lot of us would agree with. Pinheiro delivers the winner. When a team has a lead of three or less points, they seem overly willing to give up three points. Like there's a loss aversion of giving up a touchdown. I wanted to look into this further, so I ran the numbers on completion percentage by target depth. Here's what normal football looks like. As expected, completion percentage goes down as there's more depth. It's more difficult to complete a deep ball than a short one. Only 36% of passes are completed over 20 yards. Again, this is a normal football scenario. The defense doesn't necessarily know when you're going to run or pass, certainly not like they do at the end of the game if you're trailing. Now. Here's what must score situations look like with two minutes or less, down by three points. Completion percentage is relatively stable under 20 yards. Then it absolutely plummets on deep passes. The hit rate is only 17.7%. That's less than half of normal football. In general, we would expect an offense to struggle to complete more passes when the defense knows they have to throw the ball, like these late game scenarios. So let's look at games when the score is within four to seven points when the offense needs a touchdown. Sure enough, everything under 20 yards is the lowest, but over 20 yards, it's all the way back up to 31%. My belief here is this. Defenses are so afraid of getting beat by the deep ball, getting beat by one big play. They get carved up by seven to 10 play drives that get a touchdown or a field goal. That would be a miscalculation of risk and an anecdote of how our intuition might somehow be justified. In certain situations, teams are too conservative defensively. In these down by three situations, it's as if the defense views the short and intermediate game as a win. Hey, we just gave up a field goal, that's not a big deal. Or yeah, we gave up some intermediate plays, but we're not that concerned about it. We're only concerned about the deep ball. That could be problematic. Game comes down to this. Something I avoided in all of this, the mental part. We've all felt the fear of losing when we establish a lead, and that can create a bit of hesitation, a bit of second guessing. That has to play a role. Of course, we can't really quantify it, so the best we can do is isolate the pieces of the game that we can measure and work with what we got. And yet again here, it appears as though fans might have something to gripe about. Coaches might lean a little too conservatively with their play calling when they establish a lead. A bit of irony in all of that. Um, in my life, I've encountered a lot of people that see analytics as weak-minded. Yet time and time again, it seems to be proving the opposite. We need to be more aggressive. That is a hilarious slice of humanity. Hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't and take care.